Astrophotography filters are expensive. How can you be sure that you're getting your money's worth? Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'll be testing a bunch of filters using my spectrometer. Yes, this kind of testing has been done before, most notably by Creve the Lazy Geek. The difference is that the resolution of Creve's spectrometer was rather limited at about one nanometer, while my spectrometer can reach a spectral resolution of 0.03 nanometer, so about one hundredth the bandwidth of an airband filter. And with this kind of resolution, we can make very accurate measurements and see some really interesting things. So in this video, I'll describe the equipment that I use to test the filters, I'll present some of the results, and I'll also talk about the response of certain filter manufacturers, both good and bad, when confronted with the data. Today, we're keeping them honest, so let's get started. Let me first describe the equipment that I use to test the filters. This is my DIY 3D printed spectrograph, which I've talked about in previous videos. The resolution of a spectrograph like this one is a function of the width of the slit, the density of the diffraction grating, and the image scale, which is itself a function of the pixel size of the camera and the focal length of the objective lens. In my case, I keep the same slit installed at all times, and it has a width of 19 microns. And the camera that I use is a ZW ASI 533mm Pro, which has pixels that are 3.76 microns. To configure my spectrograph to work in low resolution, I can install a diffraction grating with 300 lines per millimeter and an objective lens with an 80 millimeter focal length. In that configuration, it has a spectral resolution similar to Creef spectrometer, which is roughly 10 angstrom or 1 nanometer. And to configure my spectrograph to work in high resolution, I just swap the diffraction grating with one that has 2400 lines per millimeter and the objective lens with one that has a 125 millimeter focal length. This configuration gives me a spectral resolution of 0.3 angstrom or 0.03 nanometer. So you're probably wondering why I don't always use the spectrograph in high resolution. Well, with this kind of spectrograph, the higher the resolution, the narrower the window into the electromagnetic spectrum you can study in a single measurement. So with my spectrograph, in its low resolution configuration, I can go from the near UV at roughly 3700 angstrom all the way to the near infrared at about 7500 angstrom in a single measurement. But in its high resolution configuration, the window into the electromagnetic spectrum shrinks to about 200 angstrom. So I use the low resolution configuration to study broadband filters or to check the off-band transmission of narrowband filters. But I use the high resolution configuration to check with a very high degree of accuracy the position, the shape and the FWHM of the transmission curve of a narrowband filter. Hopefully that makes sense. Now let's talk about the testing procedure. In order to test the filter, I have to acquire four images. The first image is the spectrum of a source of white light without any filter in front of it. For that, I use a flashlight equipped with a tungsten bulb. You cannot use an LED for this, especially in low resolution, because the spectrum of an LED bulb goes all over the place, whereas a good old tungsten bulb has a spectrum that is much closer to that of a black body, so it's a lot smoother. I 3D printed a jig that allows me to keep the light source perfectly orthogonal to the filter that we are going to measure. Also, I have a small diaphragm in front of the light source, so the system works more or less at f15. The second image we have to capture is the spectrum of the same exact light source, but this time going through the filter you want to measure. That's why it's so convenient to have a filter wheel with one open slot to do these measurements. I just have to rotate the filter wheel to capture these two spectra in quick succession without touching the jig. The third image is the spectrum of a neon argon high intensity discharge bulb, which gives me enough emission lines to very accurately calibrate the 2D spectrum of the light source with and without the filter in front of it. And finally, I also need to capture a bias frame, which is a very short exposure taken through the camera with the cover on. The processing software uses these four images to produce the spectral transmission profile by dividing the calibrated spectrum of the light going through the filter by the calibrated spectrum of the same exact light without the filter in front of it. 
All right, let's look at the results. We'll start with broadband luminance and RGB filters. Then we'll study several narrowband filters from different brands. I wrote a small Python script to measure the FWHM of narrowband filters, and we'll compare that value and the shape of the transmission profile with the specs provided by each manufacturer. I'll also give some commentary that may be helpful to some of you, especially if you own a refractor. In the next video, which I'll try to publish in a few weeks, we'll look at a few light pollution rejection filters, which all of you who are imaging from the city will find interesting. Let's take a look at one of my own filters, an Astronomic L3, which is a luminance filter. I purchased this specific UV-IR blocking filter because it is designed for refractors that have a less than perfect color correction, which is the case of my own budget refractor. This filter rejects everything under 420 nanometers, which is the deep blue part of the spectrum, where most refractors start to degrade pretty significantly. To understand why that is important, I prepared this slide. Here is what an uncalibrated low resolution 2D spectrum of a hot star, in this case Theta Leo, looks like through my own triplet Apple refractor across the entire visible spectrum. To better see what's going on, I stretched the image in PixInsight. We can easily identify and use the absorption lines from the Balmer series to figure out what wavelengths we're looking at. The most notable feature on this 2D spectrum is the classical fishtail effect on the left, in the deep blue part of the spectrum and the near UV, which is the telltale sign of longitudinal chromatic aberration. As you can imagine, a filter that can reject that part of the spectrum will greatly improve the sharpness of images taken with a refractor, and that's what the Astronomic L3 filter is supposed to achieve. Such a filter is many orders of magnitude cheaper than buying a super premium refractor from Takahashi, where this fishtail effect still exists, but really only starts in the near UV. So I measured two specimens of the Astronomic L3 filter, and I obtained very similar results in both cases. The band pass starts around 415 nanometers, so it's not that far off from the manufacturer specs. And the average transmission is between 90 and 95%, depending on the wavelength. This is a great filter to own if, like me, you have a budget refractor. If you own a reflector, or if you have a perfectly color-corrected refractor, like one from Takahashi, you definitely want a luminance filter that has a wider band pass, all the way down to 400 nanometers, to maximize the amount of light you collect in your luminance frames. Astronomic also sells the L2 or L1 luminance filters, and they have a slightly wider bandwidth. Next, let's look at a few sets of RGB filters. These are my own filters. They are from Entlia, and they are part of their V-series of filters. I suppose V stands for visible. The bandpass of each filter pretty much matches the manufacturer specs. In particular, you will notice that there is a little bit of overlap between the blue filter and the green filter, and that's on purpose. Also, there is a gap in the yellow part of the spectrum, because that is where high-pressure and low-pressure sodium street lamps, which appear yellow to the eye, emit the most. So technically, these filters are supposed to cut out some of the light pollution. We'll come back to that topic in much greater detail in the next video. What I find slightly disappointing with these Antlia RGB filters are the transmission numbers for the blue and the green filters, especially when Antlia claims that they can achieve 98% transmission. This made me think that I may want to switch those to a different brand. So let's look at Astronomics Deep Sky RGB filters now. Again, the band pass of each filter matches the manufacturer specs pretty closely, and the transmission looks a lot better than Antlia's, although it's still slightly under the 95% claimed by the manufacturer. I like the fact that the blue filter cuts everything under 420 nanometers, and that will improve the quality of images taken through that filter if you have a budget refractor. And finally, the Rolls-Royce of RGB filters. They are from Chroma. The transmission looks to be around 90 to 97%, depending on the wavelength, and the blue filter cuts everything under 420 nanometers, which is good for most refractor owners. In the end, even though Antlia's RGB filters were slightly disappointing, I think it's hard to go wrong with modern RGB filters, and any difference between brands would likely be hard to notice. Now let's switch to narrowband filters. In all the narrowband filters I tested, the off-band transmission was pretty much 0% everywhere, which is not surprising, but it's always good to have that confirmation. We'll start with a rather bad sample from Bader. 
While the bandwidth is surprisingly close to spec at 3.6 nanometers, the transmission at the H-alpha wavelength is about 25%, which is terrible. My friend who owns this filter reached out to Bader and they recognized that it is possible he might have received a high-speed pre-shifted filter, whereas he had purchased a standard speed filter. Even though the filter was out of warranty, Bader graciously accepted to send him a replacement unit. And to me, this is what's most important. Manufacturers can make mistakes, but it's great to see that they own up to their mistake and work with the customers to make it right. Next, we're looking at Bader's so-called CMOS-optimized set of narrowband filters. The H-alpha and O3 filters are pretty much exactly to spec, but the S2 filter had very low transmission at that precise wavelength. This filter was owned by a different person who always wondered why he was getting so little signal in his S2 subframes and simply assumed that the targets that he was imaging in SHO just emitted very little in S2. He also reached out to Bader and received the same great customer service. I'll be sure to retest these two filters when the replacement units arrive to ensure that they got what they paid for. Next up are Astronomics narrowband filters. I won't say a whole lot about these because they pretty much match the specs published by Astronomic in terms of their bandwidth and transmission numbers. In general, I get the sense that Astronomic is a pretty reliable company based on the small set of samples I've measured. The next set of filters are my very own narrowband filters from Antlia, and I was happy to see that they matched pretty much exactly the manufacturer specs published on their website. The transmission was exactly what was advertised, and the bandwidth was very close. Also, in my experience, these filters do not produce any halos on bright stars if they are correctly mounted in the filter wheel, so they are great and I can recommend them. This last set of filters are multi-narrowband filters, which are popular these days with users of one-shot color cameras. The first one is the Optolong L-Ultimate filter. I looked up the specs published by Optolong, all they state is that each bandpass is approximately 3 nanometers, and they don't publish or guarantee exact transmission numbers. I could verify that indeed each bandpass is in the neighborhood of 3 nanometer, uh, which is good, and transmission is close to 90% in O3 and about 80% in H-alpha, so this sample seemed good, and my friend reported that he was getting great results with it. Our final victim is Antlia's ALPT dual band, so-called golden filter, because it looks golden yellow when you look at it in daylight, and some people have joked that it is more expensive by weight than gold. Anyway, Antlia advertises a 5 nanometer band pass in both H-alpha and O3, and a peak transmission of 82% for O3 and 90% for H-alpha. My measurements confirmed the 5 nanometer bandwidth, but the transmission numbers were slightly off, with 74% for O3 and a disappointing 60% for H-alpha. This looks like a pre-shifted filter, which would likely do very well with a very low focal ratio, like F3 for example. In spite of the slightly disappointing transmission numbers, you will still get very good images out of that filter because you are cutting so much of the light pollution anyway. And that is a big problem because unless you measure the filter with a quality spectrometer, you would never know that this filter is actually not quite up to spec. Since it costs 380 US dollars, my friend reached out to Antlia to find out whether they'd be willing to provide a replacement. And that is where things started to get off the rails. Unlike Bader, Antlia's customer support was not helpful. At first, they claimed that it was impossible and they wanted to learn more about the testing equipment I had used. So I shared the specs of my spectrograph with them, and their response was completely nonsensical. In particular, they argued that a 19 micron slit would not provide enough accuracy. Antlia's customer service seems poor, and if you become a victim of the filter lottery, you may not have a recourse with that company, or at a minimum, they will give you the runaround. On the other hand, Bader's customer support was awesome, so this is something to keep in mind before planning your next purchase. In a future video, I will talk about filters used for light pollution rejection, to capture luminance data with a monochrome camera, or for OSC cameras when imaging from the city. I will superimpose the transmission graph of those filters with the spectrum of my own light pollution. 
to determine which one would work best for my specific conditions and whether the manufacturer's claims are actually true. I think you'll find that very interesting as well. All right, that's all I have for you today. These filter measurements are quite time consuming, so I hope that you found this video helpful. Don't forget to click like and to subscribe to the channel because we'll be back in just a few weeks with another video. So until next time, thank you for watching.